Bless the Lord. It's so good to be in God's presence, isn't it? Amen. God is worthy of our praise, and we're just honoring him this morning. We welcome those of you that are joining us online as well. Thank you for being a part of this service. Psalm 42, the first couple of verses there expresses what some of you may be witnessing this morning, and that is, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Can you read the next line with me? My tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me what where is your God let's go on when I remember these things what do I do I pour out my soul within me go ahead I used to go with the multitude I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept a pilgrim fees. The psalmist is basically saying, I'm not where I used to be, but I know how to get back. Hallelujah. And let, look, look at this next verse. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall what? Yet praise him for the help. We're going to stop with this verse. For the help of his countenance. Some versions read, for the help of his presence. How many of you know that the presence of the Lord is help? <laughs> He's a very present help in the time of trouble. His presence is our help. Why is my soul cast down? The word literally means it's referring to sometimes sheep when they would fall in the field and they couldn't get back up and it was very important to get to sheep that had fallen because unlike human beings the blood supply inside of the sheep's body would coagulate and it would form clots and he would not be able to stand and eventually die the shepherd had to be trained in how to go in and recognize that sometimes the fall is not just because you were being mischievous. You know, some sheep fell because they were mischievous. But sometimes you stumbled on something. Sometimes the sheep was pregnant and overloaded. Sometimes the, the wool, whatever it was that they were carrying, it caused them to fall. And rather than have a cast soul, God says, God says, here's your remedy. My help is your presence. My, 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 my help, brother, is, is through my presence. It's through my presence. How, how do you access God's presence? First, born again, saved. Secondly, engage with God in praise. You know, praise is not just trying to manipulate God into doing what you want him to do. Isn't that true? It's never been that for those that really understand. Praise is a response to the God that we see. The unveiled, the unveiled character of God, as God discloses his character, we, 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 we feel at times like Isaiah, I'm a man of unclean lips. So there's a call to repentance. And there are times when, when, when we begin to see into the presence of the Lord, we really begin to get inspired beyond our natural way of looking at things. And all of a sudden, I like to use that phrase, all of a sudden, where there was doubt, that doubt begins to get shattered 
because now we're convinced that the God who reveals himself to us is not only able, but he's willing to do everything that he's able to do. He's God Almighty, and there's nothing, nothing impossible for God, including helping me in my cast down position. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. And so this may seem counterintuitive to praise when you're down, but it's the very thing our flesh needs to do. It's the very thing we need to do when we don't feel like it. We bless the Lord, what? At all times. His praise shall continually be where? In my, not just in my mind, but in my mouth. Why? When I, when I, when I begin to bless the Lord and praise him openly, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. He's already living in us. It means he's enthroned in the praises of his people. Where God is enthroned, hallelujah, the miracle working power of God gets released. Come on, let's just believe the Lord for that this morning. Come on, lift your hands with me. Let's lift our hands together. Father, we bless you this morning. We praise you this morning. We magnify you, Lord, that in every place, in every place, deep calls under deep. You know where we really are. You know what we're really experiencing. And it's in you that we live and move and have our being. We stand with you, Lord, against the forces of hell that have united under the leadership of Satan against you and against your will for us. We choose to magnify your name. You're the mighty man of war. There is none, none more victorious than you, none able to overthrow you. Thank you for the witness of your spirit. You are alive and well, and we bless you this morning. We praise you this morning. We magnify your name. Come on, bless him. Bless him if you're watching. Come on, lift your hands in the presence of the Lord. Just begin to bless God. Something supernatural from God is taking place right now. We worship you, oh God. You set ambushments against the enemy. You overthrow the power of darkness. Glory to the Lamb of God. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My soul, my soul magnifies you. Hallelujah. Come on. That's it. Out of your heart, out of your spirit. Bless the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. He's worthy to receive it. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your ministry. We bless it, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Great and awesome are you, God. Great and awesome are you, God. Hallelujah. You know what? The Lord has already preceded this service with a mighty, mighty breakthrough in the heavenlies. Come on. Let's just tap into what he's already started it. It's already been going on. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We bless you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Would you tell your friend standing next to you, nothing is impossible with God. And I just encourage you to believe the Lord this morning. God's going to do great things. He's going to continue what he started. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're new to Metro, you may wonder what all of this is about, but really this is, this is what we were created for. It's, it's not just to hear the preacher. The help is his presence. Come on, somebody. Praise the name of Jesus. Come on, bless the name of Jesus. Bless the name of Jesus. Let's partake in his presence this morning. God, you're good. You're worthy to be praised. Let your will be done. Thank you for settling every issue. We bless your name. Amen. Amen. Come on. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. Come on. Here we go, everybody. Sing Holy, Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost. Comforter.
For thousands of years, various people in various civilizations have sought and even fought to try to establish what it means to be spiritual and to live a spiritual life. But God has broken through time, sent his son to the earth to die for us. That sounds like crazy talk, 
until you get into the back part of the story and understand how we were before Jesus came. The human being is an awesome creature, but the human being is also without Jesus, a creature that's been destined for failure and confusion. All of the brilliance, all of the things that we have access to falls, dries up, does not ab is not able to bring us into what our hearts really truly long for. What is that? Life. 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 Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. He prayed to his father. He said, this is life, Father, to know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you sent. In him, we live and we move and we have our being. Would you tell your friend, being is more than breathing. <laughs> it's more than breathing, folks. It's more than making money. It's more than being liked. It's more than being popular. It's more than having a, a multi-billion dollar corporation. You die and leave those good things for your children, but what a horrible, horrible legacy. If you leave them without the one thing that really helps them to live. Life in Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning for life in Jesus. And today, as we worship you out of our hearts, out of our lives, we, we thank you for that understanding that cannot be logically produced as a result of incredible research or scientific inquiry. You told Peter, flesh and blood, logical processes does not reveal this. Only the Father who is in heaven. Lord, we pray for those who are without the persuasion of who you are, who've been preached to, who've been told, who've had this live before them, but they're still not convinced yet. Father, we look to you to do what we as human beings, even Christians, we cannot do. For the spirit of truth, you spirit of truth, you're the only one that convinced us. We've come from so many places, so many sides of the track, so many different backgrounds, so many things, Lord. Only you, it wasn't the PhD. It wasn't the scholarly research. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. It was you. You made yourself known to us. You convinced us that you're God, almighty God. There is none beside you. I wonder how many people in this room could say he convinced me. He convinced me. Lift your hands and say, thank you for convincing me. You convinced me. Hallelujah. Paul said it like this. I know in whom I have believed. Now I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him until that great day that he shall return. Lord, let it be so that we would be the kind of witnesses that you want of the earth. Friends of God, just as Abraham walked with you, grant us that same wisdom, that same favor, that same grace. We receive it, for we are children of Abraham by faith. Let your will be done in us. Thank you for the healing verse of the Lord, present in the room right now, ministering your grace in our emotions and in our minds and in our bodies and our relationships. May we emerge from this place, walk out of these doors, richer and fuller, usable by you. May those that we encounter this week encounter you as a result of what we've encountered in you today. In the name of the Lord, amen. 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 I want to, uh, again, welcome those of you that are with us. Maybe two or three of you are with us for the first time. If you're here, please raise your hand. We'd like to acknowledge your presence. And we will not ask you, okay, it looks like most people have been here before. Thank you for joining. If you're joining with us online, and perhaps this is your first time, we'd like to acknowledge um, you as well. Please indicate so by just simply texting that number that you see on the screen there. And we want to encourage you to be a part of our prayer list. That's why we get your name, uh, and we 
let you know about a few things that will be happening over the course of the year as we get together in this time. On uh, Wednesday night, we'll be back together again for our second of four uh, training times that we call our Disciple Makers Training Camp. Uh, we believe here that one of the main reasons why God gave us life and birth as a congregation uh, as he's done many congregations around the world is that we might participate with him in the discipleship of the nations that's not a cult group and that's not the alt cult we can't force this we can't take an ak and make anybody become a christian but uh, we do want you to know that that's the reason why we're here uh, all the things that god has chosen to do for us and even in us ultimately ought to be expressed in that us winning people and helping them to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk with him. Years ago, I mentioned this last week, years ago, just as my, my last year, my college days, undergraduate days there is, that is, I asked the Lord what he wanted me to do. And he had spoken some things prior to that. And unexpectedly, the Lord gave me a vision. And in the vision, I was standing on the, for those of you that are from St. Louis, you'll be familiar with this area. I was in downtown St. Louis on the corners of 7th and Washington. Many of you in your mind, if you go back, if you're old enough, you remember that was a pretty bustling area back in the day. Most of the department stores and all that was downtown St. Louis. Since then, the malls and now Amazon has taken over. But uh, it was a pretty popular place to be. I worked in one of the uh, department stores down there for almost two years before I left to go away to college. So I was familiar with the area. And I turned around and saw a a 21-story building in that spot. It was not as it is even now. There's a beautiful building there now. But I saw a beautiful 21-story building there. God spoke to my heart. I saw flags from around the nations at the top. And I asked the Lord, I said, what is this? And he said, this is, this is the ministry I'm calling me to. And on each floor, there were different things that were being done. People were being trained to uh, learn languages and uh, translate the Bible and some other things. Others were being trained to go other parts of the world some were being trained to stay here in this in, in not only in st louis but in the united states there was worship gathering places and so forth it was beautiful beautiful build and as i walked into the uh, tried to walk into the lobby area this was back before a lot of the electronic and digital stuff that we see today i noticed the doors were opening on their own that's how old i am you used to have to walk on black mats for the doors to open in buildings but the doors were opening on their own People were walking out, teeming out, and just hundreds and hundreds of people were coming out of this building, going in and out of it. And I noticed that they were multi-ethnic, red, yellow, black, white, and brown, all the different shades and colors. And people were dressed according to their professions, what they lived uh, to do and what they were doing in order to live, so to speak. And some had hard hats on, like in construction, others I uh, saw people that were medical personnel with stethoscopes and other things of that nature. Various ones had briefcases and they were coming in and out of the place. Uh, and as I prayed about it, trying to figure out what was going on, I heard a couple of passages of scripture about going into all the world and preaching the gospel, making people aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I thought God was telling me I was supposed to build a school that was what was in my mind at the time. That was my interpretation of it. And we, we will probably get to some aspect of that in, the, in these latter phases of my life. But uh, I know that what the Lord really shared in my heart was that those people were being trained to go into their lives with the gospel so that what they were trained to do in terms of their professions was not the main reason why they were living. It really wasn't. They weren't just living to be architects and engineers and doctors and attorneys and those kinds of things. God was conditioning them and preparing them, and we were a part of that, to help them to go into every area of life equipped with the knowledge of God. In fact, uh, and, and, and the gospel, winning people into the kingdom of God. In fact, I heard a, a verse of scripture as I was walking through the door. Uh, and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth like the waters cover the sea and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. I had to look those verses up later. One is from Habakkuk, another was from the book of Isaiah. 
walked into the to the lobby area and I saw what looked like a fountain had been built, beautifully constructed, and there was a globe hanging without any attachments, and it was spinning on an axis. What got my attention, this is the day before holograms, uh, what got my attention was there was water coming and spilling all over that globe. And again, I heard those scriptures again. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. I got so enthralled, I was trying to figure out how in the world uh, the architects and the designers had been able to craft a globe that was spinning on its own. And I saw no pipes, I saw nothing that connected the water so that it could flow like that. And I was looking around trying to figure out, well, how did they do that? How did they do that? How am I gonna put this in a building? How am I gonna put this in a building? I can't see how they did that. I was immediately taken into the stratosphere, kind of like if you've been to uh, the Space Aeronautic System uh, Museum there in DC, or you've been to uh, the Space Center here, or the, what is it they called, the, the, uh, out here on 40, it's the Science Center, if, you, if you're there, big huge screen that's what it was like all of a sudden I was there in the stratosphere and looked around very very quiet astronauts tell us that that's how it is there and eventually I heard a trickle of water a trickle of water and to my right I could see the earth spinning just like I'd seen down there in that in that lobby and this water began to just move I turned in the direction of the sound I didn't see anything I just turned in the direction of the sound and that, that, that sound became visible as we began to see just a little trickle of water that grew into a little stream that grew into a river that expanded uh, widthwise into a mighty river. And as the river passed me, I was standing right here strung in space, as it passed me, the, the river sounded like an ocean. It wasn't the ocean, but it sounded like an ocean. There were waves, and most of you know rivers don't really have that but uh, there were waves, and in the waves, there was a little, still small voice whispering various things that, that have in one word, except the very last phrase, repentance, renewal, restoration, revival. And then one final phrase, a move of my spirit that the average person on the street will not be able to deny. And that mighty river rushed toward the earth that was part of the knowledge of God that he was exposing to me, what he was about to do. Came upon the earth, began to just lap the earth, what appeared to be hands without color, began to wash the earth and wring it out like a sponge. Many people began to weep and rejoice and bless the Lord and others were weeping and crying. Heard a word from the Lord through much persecution, many would enter into the kingdom of God. And I asked, I said, why, you know, I at the time was maybe 23, 24 years old. Why are you showing me this? I'm, you know, I'm just a kid, really. What's going on? And I named him some people that he could show it to. The arrogance. <laughs> uh, trying to tell God. And he spoke to my heart, made it clear. He said, because this is something I'm going to do in your generation. And I'm raising up many others many, many others that I'm going to make a part of what I'm doing in the earth. And all of a sudden, I was right back down the earth. I was walking out of that lobby. And I was standing there on the corner, dazed at what was going on. It looked very natural, like just a regular high class level business environment. But what I had seen was way beyond what I'd been shown. I didn't conjure it up. What I'd been shown was way beyond the building. It's way beyond what it looked like something that was really just a nice, super nice, classy building. Uh, I stood there on the corner, dazed, and the Lord told me to look to my right, and I looked to my right, which was east, looking east. And coming across the east bridge was a white train with a red, purple, and blue stripe across the front of it. I came into downtown St. Louis, dipped two or three times, went out northwest toward the airport. I didn't know, as I mentioned to you last week, I didn't know what was coming. 1977, when the Lord showed me that, a few years later, four, five, six years later, I was home and I saw the sign coming to St. Louis. 
Metrolink. White train, red, purple, and blue stripe across the front. I thought God wanted me to move to D.C. That's where I'd say they were, they were building their metro line back in those days You from that area. And uh, I thought, oh, maybe I'm supposed to go to D.C. and plant a church there. And the Lord said, no, it's St. Louis. I'm going to do some things here in St. Louis. Several, several years ago, I was with uh, then Congressman Jim Talon. He was running for, for office and he asked several pastors to come together. They asked us why we were here in St. Louis. I told, amongst other brothers in Christ, that story. That's why I'm here. I'm here because God is determined to raise up a people through whom he will reveal the knowledge of his glory. Amen. We are a part of that. We are a part of that. And I encourage, if you've not had that kind of experience, please don't take me telling you this to mean that God doesn't use you or that you're not as important as me or that you're not as spiritual as I am. It doesn't mean any of that. It doesn't mean any of that. I didn't know that would happen to me. I didn't ask for that. I asked God to tell me what to do with my life. He decided to show me that. That's the will of God. And several of you that you're here and over the years you've come in and out of Metro, you've come. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. I started with the first leadership team telling this story, this part of the vision. The vision of the Lord is the word of the Lord in the scriptures. And what we're seeing and what I've just shared with you is some of the practical application of how that will be manifested. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. The Hebrew there is, your young men shall be chin men. The vision is all of this. See, but where God shows us portions, portions of what he is going to do and our part in it. I can't convince you, only the Holy Spirit, that's not my job, so I'm not gonna belabor this any longer. But uh, all of this month, God's laid upon my heart to just rehearse the vision, rehearse the vision. When you come into a local church, God, if the leader has been set there by the Lord, has given a vision. He's given him or her. Uh, and it's not all about him or her, but it is important to understand the priority of that particular vision that he's given to leadership. Because that's what God has called that leader to do. That's the chin men part. And everyone that's being united under that sometimes don't understand because God has shown them portions of the chin too. See? Don't know, always know how it clicks and how it comes together and how it fits. And we can get into a bunch of jockeying for position and jockeying for a bunch of stuff. But that, you know, that's childish, right? That's childish. The Holy Spirit is very capable of helping us to see how it all fits how to learn to walk together, to do the will of God. And so I, 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 I welcome you not only into this manifestation of God's presence, but also into the vision of the Lord as he has expressed it to me uh, and others of us who've embraced it for this particular house. And if we'll do our part, we'll do our part. Remember how Nehemiah assigned different ones on the wall to build? Everybody had a part, had a section to take care of. We'll do our part. We'll get this done. Look at somebody said, this is going to happen. This will happen if we'll do our part. But if we decide just to make up a part to do, no matter what, then we, we, we can mess it up. We can really mess it up really bad. So I encourage you to be a part of this. I said all that to say, I encourage you to be a part of this disciple makers camp, training camp. It's one thing to come and receive the word of the Lord and to be discipled and to be blessed and to be encouraged, to be strengthened and to be healed and to be delivered and liberated and helped with food and clothes and things and all that. That's, man, shame on us if we're not doing that, right? But it's another thing to come and learn how to do that in the life of somebody else and to minister in equal portions and even greater portions in the lives of other people, fellow believers, and certainly in the lives of people who have never given their lives to the Lord. Be, be, be assured that God really has his hand upon you. He has his hand upon you. He has his hand upon us for something great. The knowledge of the 
glory of the Lord. Think about that. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord being ministered not only to me and in me, but through me. Uh, get Some of you, I see you, you, get your suitcases ready because the Lord's going to spring us all over the earth. That's what last month was about. Good to see you, Tracy. He's going he's gonna to spring us all over the earth. You're not your own, right? Right? You're bought with a price. Solomon said, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. So much of life is just vain seeking. It really is. You really want to be fulfilled? Go after what God has in his heart for you. And if that, if that means that you got to leave St. Louis, uh, do it. If it means you got to leave Metro to do it, do it. Hallelujah. I kind of see us kind of like, you know, I love to see everybody that's been here always be here. No, no. God told me they want no. Train them to be released, to be released, to go where I'm sending them, where I want them to be. Amen. And so we love you. We bless you. We pray that God will use you for his glory. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock this week, next week, and then the following week. And then we launch into a whole summer. Well, we're going to focus on this. We do it every summer. been doing it every summer since we've been a local church. Of course, it needs to be happening every day, right? Every single day. Daily God adds to the church. But this is a period of time that we've carved out to train, to teach, to go out. And this year, we'll probably be able to go out. In the last few, we weren't because of COVID and some other things. So we're looking forward to that. We're still going to focus a lot on our individual lives and when witnessing and ministering personally, relationally, we're also going to create some times uh, where we can go to the street again like we've been doing. Friday night again is a time for you to be able to spend time with family and friends if you like. And uh, in prayer, we've changed the schedule, lightened it up a little bit so that our Fridays are now free for you to do any one of those three things. Family and friends or what we call now house to house where you get together with another believer in Christ that's a part of Metro and then also any personal time that you want to spend with your family for that Friday. We have several other prayer times, and we encourage you to do that as well. Well, God bless you. Looking forward to this. Let's return our tithe to present our offerings to the Lord, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're doing the rest of this month here in a few minutes. Okay, let's prepare. We're going to present our offerings to God. Let me get out of your way so that you can see the declaration and the prayer that we pray every week. As we do it together, you can give online, of course, or by mail. And some of you may want to do it here in, this, in the auditorium or in the sanctuary today. Let's do it together. Let's say it together. Lord Jesus Christ, we present unto you our tithe and offerings in worship and faith. We believe as you receive them, you'll give back to us as we have cheerfully sown into your kingdom. We promise to faithfully manage the blessings in return to give to us. Thank you for your bountiful gifts. We love you. We bless you. Amen. Come on, just lift that to the Lord, if you will. You at home, join us. Lift it to God, give him thanks for the privilege. You're giving it to Jesus Christ, our high priest. Amen. In the family, in the household of faith. God bless you. Well, of course, you know, next Sunday is uh, Father's Day. And uh, we're thankful for our fathers. Next week, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, the man that I wanted to minister next week has to be out. And so uh, we figured out a way where he'll still be able to minister, and that's today uh, instead. And we are very, very pleased and honored that he's here to be with us today. Uh, third Sunday, the Sunday after Father's Day, we'll also be spending a little more time. So this, this little three-week period is going to be a time for us to really learn how to explore and understand fatherhood in a, in a godly way, in a better way, and it will come through other men and even hopefully women of God that will help us to really understand that better and to walk that out this Sunday, next Sunday, and then the following Sunday, and then the last Sunday in the month. Uh, yours truly will be back to, to minister a little bit on a couple of things that God's laid on, on my heart too as before we launch into the summer of uh, our Summer Sunday series. All right, many of you know Brother Jared Jones, he said to me last, he said to me last year, he said, uh, Bishop, 
I, I'm, I'm not a minister in training. I said, that's great. This is wonderful uh, because you're the guy. You're the guy because most people are not in the conventional, traditional sense, ministers in training for a local church post. They're ministers in training to do what you do. Live the life, share the gospel. Uh, when, when we first met, uh, we was over in another building and I walked in and Jerry was sitting in the back, his feet up on the back of the seat, chilling. I said, I like this dude already. We went over and talked a little bit, and he's been coming ever since. He was about 19 or 20 then. And he's, he's been faithful and been serving and poured into our lives over the years here in this local church as well. I want to read some stuff about him that I didn't even know. All right? And he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff he's been doing and the, and the work that God has put in his heart to do. And we want to be a part of that. I want our, the church family to do that. Jerry Jones has been a dedicated middle school English teacher for 17 years. Wow. Y'all look too much older than 17. <laughs> Serving in the University City and Webster Grove school districts, his dynamic teaching approach reflects his passion, many of us remember that, for literature and writing. With a background in journalism, Jared has contributed as a reporter and a writer for both campus and local newspapers. He holds a bachelor's degree in media communication from Webster University and a master's degree in secondary education. Beyond the classroom, he channels his diverse interests in sports. He's a baller for real, serious. Music and education into crafting compelling stories that blend real life scenarios with fictional prose and poetry. His debut novel, some of you may want to pick it up today, My Invisible Father, explores themes of spirituality and diversity through engaging characters. To enhance the reader's experience, he also integrates music and music videos with his books, providing a multimedia and audiovisual experience. In addition to his teaching career, Jared enriches the community through his work at the St. Louis County Library. He's also spent nearly 15 years in various church ministry roles, uh, including maintenance, he did it for us here, media, team ministry. He's married to his beautiful wife, Shiloh, and they together have four grown children. And we're happy to, for them to be here with us today. Let's stand, if you will, please. He's one of our own, but we bless him today. Praise the Lord. His dad and mom, Melvin and Rhonda, good to see you, man. God bless you. Bless you, man. Good to see you. Bless you. Let's welcome them. Thank you. Check, check, one, two. You got me? All right, all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, Bishop pretty much laid out who I am, what I do, um, so I'll give you a little bit more of that as we go throughout this, uh, this service, this message today. Um, I don't covet this position, as he just mentioned. Um, most of you all know I am an introvert, so this is not something that I strive to do. This is something that I believe God has called me to do, is to speak to people. Uh, becoming a teacher was... Um, something that I wanted to do ever since I was like 13 years old. But I thought to myself sometimes, how can you be a teacher and be an introvert and don't like talking to people? <laughs> but I think God just allows me to muster up the strength, the ability, the grace to be able to do those things and even to do this, what I'm doing today. So I am going to, if you can go ahead and start the slides for me, I am going to um, go through a couple of things. This is kind of a, this is kind of a um, different service because not only am I going to be bringing a message, I'm going to also be promoting my book. <laughs> so... You know, we don't see that very often of promoting things in church, but Bishop almost commanded me to do this, so 
I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, the book's been out for three years, but he came to me last fall and said, you know what? I really, I feel like I dropped the ball. I, I think I want to promote your book to the church. And I was like, okay, if that's what you want to do, you know. Um, and we tried to decide on what would be the best. And I felt at the time that it'd be probably best to do it during um, uh, Father's Day. Uh, but as he mentioned, we won't be here next week. We have the privilege of going to Orlando, Florida next weekend on Father's Day, or uh, Father's Day's weekend. Uh, we're going to visit our youngest daughter, who is actually doing some ministry, minute, campus ministry there for the summer. It's a great opportunity. Um, we, when she came to us, we was like, how much that's gonna cost? That's the first thing we asked. <laughs> Um, but she raised pretty much 80 to 90% of it. And the other costs will come from her because while they're there, they're going to be working at SeaWorld. Well, they are working at SeaWorld. She's there now. So some, the rest, $200 or whatever that's left, she just, it just comes out of her check and she'll be free um, to, to continue on. So that was a blessing. Um, so we will be there next, Sun next weekend is uh, Parents Weekend. So we'll be able to travel down there and um, be with her. Um, so that's why we won't be here next week. All right, so um, I am privileged to have one of my four kids here with me today. And of course, my wife, Shiloh. Uh, Shiloh Marie, we've been married for 17 and a half years, almost 18 years. Uh, she is such a caring person, a caring woman. Um, we have a lot of discussions on a lot of different things, a lot of topics. She, she's kind of like a social justice uh, <laughs> caveat when it comes to just talking about what's wrong with our world. And sometimes we have conversations that involve um, race. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we are two different races or <laughs> ethnic groups. Um, but we have the same mind spirit when it comes to it, and that, that's a blessing. Um, she's a forgiver. She's a, she's a warrior. Um, she's been through a lot. She's been through a lot with me, and even before me. I think you heard some of that when last time I spoke of some things that she went through even before we met. Um, so she's a warrior, and she's um, my friend, my girlfriend. She's beautiful, and I love her. Yeah. And my oldest, Kylan, um, he's a wrestler right now, like not Olympic-style wrestler, like WWE wrestling. Um, he had a match this weekend. He was going to try to come. Um, we'll see if he makes it. Not sure. Um, but he is, uh, he's the leader of our four, and we, I can be more proud of him and them, um, Jalen, my old, second oldest, uh, and then Lael, who's here with us today. Hello, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> Lael just got her master's degree in school counseling, so oh. she's... I, I'm, I'm proud that at least one of my kids kind of followed me a little bit. Um, I'm trying to get her in my school. I don't know if she really wants to come to my school and see dad every day, but uh, that, that would be great. And she brought her good friend, Patrick. How you doing, sir? Uh, we met Patrick, I don't know, six months ago or whatever. We still haven't gotten together to have lunch or dinner together, so I'm still waiting on that invitation, Leo. All right. Um, today we are going to discuss fatherhood and fiction. As Bishop already discussed, I, I have written a book called My Invisible Father. And um, the book is about three teenagers that we'll, we'll get a little taste of their lives today who are struggling with their relationships with their fathers. And it's important to note that these three are not only dealing with that, but they're dealing with just teenage stuff. We all know about teenage stuff, right? Either you've been a teenager or you have teenagers or have had teenagers. 
Um, and it can be difficult to try to navigate through life like that. But when you add in the fact that you're having difficulties with relationship with your parents or your fathers in this sense, uh, it makes it even more difficult. And we do have an answer for that. Um, so we'll, we'll continue on and get there. So my platform as a, oh, wrong one, as a writer for this particular book, I'm covering three different aspects right now. Um, I'm sure they'll change if I get to write more books. Um, those platforms may change a little bit. But right now, for me, um, I'm looking at, obviously, fatherhood, the importance of early childhood literacy, and then a connection between illiteracy and crime and poverty. So you'll see a lot of that, all three of those aspects in this book. Um, I do have a sequel hopefully coming out. I've written about half of it. And it will deal more on the connection between illiteracy and crime and poverty a little bit more. Um, but all of these things will, you'll see in my books as I write them. Now, I have so many book titles that I've come up with. And you know I can't live long enough to write them all. But I just want to be able to write the ones that I feel God is calling me to do at those times. And this first one, for whatever reason, he kind of put me into this fatherhood um, and, well, really, the reason is, is because before I wrote this book, I wanted to write a book on parenting. Um, this was 20-something years ago. And, of course, my kids were really young at the time. And I did some research, and I was thinking about it. And I didn't know a whole lot, but I thought the research and even writing a book would help me as a parent as well. But things changed. I got divorced way back then. and had to pretty much start over my life. Um, that's when I decided to go back to school and become a teacher, um, the, the, my, one of my childhood dreams at that time. And um, I just kind of stopped thinking about writing books. I just need to get myself together. That's, that's where I was at that time. Just going through that, that uh, issue um, kind of drew back some things, and, and obviously writing was one of them. But when I started, um, and we're back, going back to the illiteracy and crime and poverty, I started working at a juvenile facility. And while working there, I saw and noticed these kids who could not read. And this is before I started teaching. I think I, I, I ended up going to school about two years into that working there. And it really touched me in the sense where, man, these kids, the connection, there's a connection. They can't read. They, they don't do well with arithmetic. They don't like school. Um, there was a connection of those kids who are there, now there. They would skip school. They would steal cars. That's just what they did. And I realized part of the reason is because they were not motivated to go to school. Um, some of them could not read. Most of them could not read. And I started thinking about writing a book for those kids, books that they can understand books that relate to their lives so that now, OK, now I, I kind of like this book. You know, there would be two kids in the group out of 10 that could read. And I would ask them, what do they like to read? And they like to read real, raw material, right? They like to read things that they're dealing with. But in everything they read, they need a message behind it. So that's where I felt like I wanted to um, write something for those kids. And. In doing so, or in, in, in starting that, that's what got me to write My Invisible Father. I left from being, you know, writing about parenthood, even though this really still is. My audience, this is really interesting. Um, my audience basically is middle school students and high school students. We call the genre young adult fiction. So it appeals to teenagers and then those in their early 20s as well. Uh, my audience also includes public libraries and juvenile centers. Um, I've spoken at a few libraries already. I've lined up a couple of juvenile centers that I'm going to speak at this summer. Um, so that is in, that's great. I've, I've spoken to a couple of high schools. So those are my, my, that's my audience. But my audience also is churches and youth groups because, again, there's a message behind what I'm trying to um, write with these fictional books. 
I always ask my kids in seventh grade, you know, what, what's the difference between fiction and nonfiction? And they say nonfiction is not fake, and fiction is fake. In a sense, it is, but a lot of fiction can be generated from real life, and that's what I try to do even with the fiction. Um, even though this is my audience, I have realized that this book is for older adults as well. And that's because of what I've heard even from those who have read it. Um, the most interesting part about this is when I wrote my, wrote my first draft and sent it to my editor, she came back and asked me, she said, what is your audience or who is your audience? I said, teenagers. And she said, yeah, the story is about a teenager, but the voice that you have is not for teenagers. It sounds like it's written for adults. So I had to rewrite my whole book. I probably kept two chapters in there that were pretty similar, but I had to rewrite the entire book. Now, that's not uncommon in the writing world to write one draft, sometimes a second draft, and have to write a whole nother draft. But when I was researching writing and I heard that or I read that, I was like, nah, I'd never do that. That's stupid. Who's going to write a whole nother book another again, you know? Um, but I realized that that is the best way to write because when you think about the first time you write, and I teach my students this, the first time you write something, you have to go back and review everything that you've written with a fine tooth comb. Like you have to really look at every single thing. And some of us will feel like, hey, this is the best it can be. I can't do any better than this. But when you have other people that can speak to you, now you can see differently. Because if you wrote it, of course you think it's good, right? <laughs> You, hey, I wrote this, of course I think it's good. But when you get others to say no, um, give you some advice and so forth, and I'm so glad that happened because I went back and read like the first 10 chapters of my first draft a couple, probably about a month ago, and it was sucky. Like it's, it was trash and I am so glad that I listened to my editor because yikes, you know. Um, but, the, the crazy thing about it is I did write, rewrote, write it, I did rewrite it, and um, instead of having one main character who was a teenager, I included three main characters who were teenagers. And instead of the voice being mostly about the adults who were talking about the kids, it was mostly about the kids talking about the kids. Of course, there's some sprinkling of the adults as well in there um, right now, but, Probably the first phone call I got after the book was released was from a 70-year-old woman. And she told me this is a book that should be on the bestsellers list. And I'm like, whoa, you sure about that? But that spoke to me right away that, okay, even though I, I went back and did what the editor said and I wanted to write for teenagers, it showed me that I can reach more than just the audience that I was intending to reach. And that makes me feel good and, and makes me feel like I, I'm doing the right thing. I'm on the right path, right? I teach in front of 12, 13 year olds every day, but I feel like I can talk to you all as well who are not quite in the seventh grade, right? <laughs> so that's my audience and those are the, the um, things that I try to write, you know, I try to use my writing to reach those who are listening. Um, motifs. This is really a English language arts word. It's a, a, a teaching word. And basically what it means is it's a repeated pattern, an image, a sound, a word, or symbol that comes back again and again within a particular story. It's really a fancy way of saying topics. Right? Well, we teach our kids uh, in the seventh grade that these are motifs. And in My Invisible Father, the motifs that you will see coming up over and over again, fathers, friendship, crime, poverty, race relations, and even sacrifice. Now that's important because you, when you have different motifs or topics that keep coming up over and over again, basically what that means is it's pointing to a theme. T-H-E-M-E, -E, 
What is the theme of this fiction novel? And when you have a theme, a theme basically is the message. What is the overall message that is being taught in this book? So either what is the author trying to say to you or teach you? What is the, well, uh, the character, main character or characters trying to say to you or what lesson have they learned? So motifs are very important to be able to recognize because they point towards that theme. My main characters are Jaren Foster, Camry Covington, and Asen Dinner. These are three teenage kids. Jaren is a 15-year-old black kid who lives in an inner city, St. Louis. The, the book is set in St. Louis, and I have some, a few landmarks that are talked about in that story, and I can't wait to the second one because I want to include some others that I've been thinking about that will really make a lot of sense, but it's set in St. Louis, so he's in the inner city of St. Louis. Camry Covington is a 15-year-old black girl who lives in the inner city of St. Louis. And then Ace and Dinner is a 14-year-old white kid who lives in the suburbs. I know I, that was kind of prejudice or something for me to do that, but that's just how it just turned out, okay? Um, and these, these three characters have their, again, their struggles that they have with their teenage life in school, um, but at home, and they also have struggles with their fathers. Jaren's father never wanted anything to do with him. Camry's father's in prison, and Asen's father is there, but is not there. He's in the, he's in the home, but he um, works a lot, owns his own business, out of town, and does not have a connection or a relationship with his son. Camry Covington, by the way, her father, her biological father's in prison, but she has a wonderful, wonderful stepfather who lives in the home who introduced the family to Jesus. So that's our only Christian, so to speak, family in the book. And um, so I'm not going to go too much more into that because we'll talk about the book a little bit more. But my epigraph, the epigraph is usually like a quote that you may put in the book to kind of give you a, a, an idea or can point also to the theme of the story. But I chose to use the, these three scriptures as my epigraph. All right, uh, Colossians 3.15, 2 Corinthians 4.18, and John 12.46. So we're about to look at those scriptures. Um, and, but before we do, let's just pray real quickly. Father, we thank you for this time and this opportunity for me to share what you've placed on my heart with your people. We pray that your hand will be upon me, um, your voice will be my voice, your steps will be my steps, your hands will be my hands. We thank you for your grace and mercy and peace and your loving kindness and your forgiveness. We give you praise, glory, and honor for what you will do in this place for those that hear this word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, Colossians 1.15. It says, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So I looked at a couple words here that really I'm focusing on. Um, we know the sun, we're talking about Jesus, but the image in this um, scripture, in this passage, image here, pronounced icon, uh, is a likeness that is literally a statue or a profile or figuratively a representation or resemblance. So basically what that's saying is it's looking just like the other. The sun is the image of the invisible God. So God is saying Jesus is looking just like God. Hold on for a second, though, because when you say that and then say that, that God is invisible, how can you say that he looks like him if we don't know what he looks like because he's invisible? So when I look at the word in invisible and this word in this passage, aoritos, I know I'm not saying that right, but God will forgive me. Um, it's a negative particle, an invisible thing, and this is the 
crazy part. It's derived from the word alpha, the first letter of the alphabet. In other words, it doesn't mean alpha, but it comes from, the, it comes from a word that means alpha. It comes from the, the, the first letter of the alphabet. And I'm like, how, how does that even connect, right? We'll talk about that here in a second. But, so I'm looking at this, this scripture right here, and it's saying that the image of the invisible God is the firstborn over all creation. It's saying that the sun, the sun is the image. The sun basically is saying it's like God, or it is God, right? It's representing God in place of God. But it's not really in place because they're base, basically the same. Okay, and you probably may be looking at me like, what do you mean? But we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out in a second. So I'm gonna go through these scriptures. And here is a second scripture that was not part of that, um, uh, the first three of my epigraph, but I wanted to include this as well because we maybe you see it a little differently or see it a little better. Hebrew, Hebrews 1.3 says, the sun is the brightness or the radiance of the glory of the Father and the express image the exact representation of perfect imprint and very image of his person of holding all things by the word. And that word image there means character. And it could mean character like someone who's playing the part of something, or it could mean character like a gro graver tool, a a character, something that you use to create a letter, engraving characters. Um, it's the figure stamp that is an exact copy or representation. So when you think about characters who play parts in movies and shows, the best characters, and I'm not one who watch a lot of movies, but I know that the best characters are the ones who play that character so well, you almost think that that's who that really is. I, I think Denzel won a um, Oscar for, what was Training Day? Because he's playing this really bad cop. People started hating Denzel after that because he played it so well that it felt like he was a bad cop. So it's almost like you play that character to the T that you almost think that you, you are that person. So you can think about it that way. But you can also think about it as a character in the sense of your character, how you are as a person. Who are you as a person, okay? What is your character like? What is your personality like? But here, it's saying it's a graver tool or a person engraving characters the figure stamp that is an exact copy or representation. So once you think about like, there are probably about 10 people in here who probably never used a typewriter, but I want you to think about a typewriter, right? A typewriter has those, um, they call striker tools or strikers. And those strikers have letters on them. And when they hit the paper, you have an exact representation of that letter. So I'm going to show you the picture real quickly. All right? So those strikers, when they hit the piece of paper, if you have an A or B, when it hits that piece of paper now, along with the ink, you see an A or B on that piece of paper. Now, it is backwards, right? It's not a mistake. That's how it's, it is written, or how, that's how they write on it. You take the backwards letter, hit it on top of that paper, and now that paper is the right side way, or the right way. I want to go back to one thing, because when I saw that, I said, oh, I kind of get that now. I think I need to go back one more. Invisible. Negative particle. When we think of the word invisible, maybe we usually think about something that we can't see, something that is not there, something that does not exist. But 
it says it's a negative particle and invisible thing. How can something be a thing and still be invisible? So what God is showing us here is that the invisible God is something that does exist, even though we can't see him. When we think of invisible, we think about magic tricks. Whoo, where'd it go? It's, it's invisible. No, it was, it was never like that. Like, it's playing with your mind, right? It's still there. You just can't see it. With God, he's not saying, I disappeared. He's not saying, I'm not something that doesn't exist. I exist. You just can't see me. But we can. I'll show you how. But this, 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 um, negative particle. I'm like, what do you mean by a negative particle? And I started thinking about, again, some of you all won't know what we're talking about, but when you take pictures to Wal or, or film to Walgreens or the old Fox photo booths, um, you have a, what, what do they call those things? The, the, um, that you, you, and that's on the roll. Come on, you. Negatives, negatives, right? Okay, so when you take, and I used to, I think in the 11th grade, I took a photo photography class and we would take pictures around the school, people, you know, in classrooms, in the gym, and then part of our grade was to take those negatives to the dark room. And what happened would be everything that was dark in that dark room, where we, everything that was on that negative that was dark became light, and everything that was light became dark. Negative, negatives, that's the negatives. And I started thinking again about this whole negative particle. See, there's a negative particle in our world that we live in, and we need the light, we need a representation, we need a typewriter. Why do we need a typewriter? Oh my gosh. Let me, let me tell you, let me tell you why we need a typewriter. I'm gonna tell you what that is in a second. All right. So um, also with besides the typewriter, I want you to think about the thing called a um, epigraph. We talked about epigraphs early, usually an inscription or a um, quote. But it's also um, we find them on inscriptions of a building. Okay. Remember the old cartoons with the cavemen and they're knocking in on the stone and making these letters with these gravers? And of course, you might be familiar with things like this, right? Creating these letters, creating these characters, that's another word for letter. When you're typing, right, and it, you see how many letters you have, it also says how many characters you may have. Each, word, each letter creates a word. Each letter creates a word. So when I started thinking about the fact that Jesus is the word, right? John 1. Um, I also started thinking about how we, as humans, write words with characters, with letters. And I, I went back one more time because I still was confused. And I'm like, God, what do you mean by an invisible thing being derived from the alpha? Who's the alpha? God. He's the beginning of everything. He's the first letter in every word. Even if it's not an A, he's the beginning. So when we are making, writing these letters, these words, all right, and this all comes back to me and creating and writing a book. Book or books are full of words. And I've realized that even if my book is not a Christian book, I still got to have the word in there. Because it's going to point people towards that A, that alpha. All of these words are going to point, him to point people towards that representation of God. Who's the representation of God? Jesus. So, when you look at the fact that we can't see God, but we do see God in Jesus, when we point people to Jesus, we're basically pointing them to the God, the Alpha. So that's why I write words. I write letters. I write characters so that people can be pointed and see that 
invisible thing. All right, part of my, uh, my um, title is, you know, the invisible father. Um, and it's about, you know, always being able to see the unseen. See the unseen. And this is the way you can see the unseen. Let me go to that next scripture and we'll see that a little bit more. 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And that word fix uh, is the word scopio. It means to take aim at, kind of like spying to regard, to consider, to take heed, to look at, to focus. And we get words like scope, telescope, microscope. So we're really fixing our eyes on Jesus. I mean, we're looking at Jesus. And when we look at Jesus that way, we see God the Father. This word seeing, blepo, means to behold, to beware, to look at, to perceive, to take heed, to regard. So we're not looking at something that is always something we can see with our physical eyes, but we got to see it with our spirit. We have to see it with our, our even our conscience in some way. Um, but, but how do we see if it's dark? John 12, uh, 46 says, I have come into this world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. How do we see a, a, a God that we can't see in this dark world? Again, we're pointing back to Jesus. He is that light. And what does this have to do with Father's Day, right? I told you we're going to mesh Father's Day with this book and with these scriptures. Basically, what that is saying is what we're, you know, what we're really saying is that the Father, God, can be seen in Jesus, his son. As fathers, our children should be emulating what we do to some degree. We should be able to be a light, a beacon of hope. We should be able to um, be an example. Paul said, follow me, follow me as I follow Christ. So if we're following Christ, um, our kids, our children, our sons, our daughters, they have a, a visible, they have a visible representation of what it means to follow Christ. They will see our mistakes because they are in the house and they see them, but they also see, see, also see us forgiving each other. They also see us praying and asking God for forgiveness. They also see us reading the word. If they see those things, they are now seeing a representation just like we see with God and his son. The word light means to shine or make manifest by rays, fire. Uh, manifest means to show plainly, to discover, to disclose. And darkness, scotia, is a dimness and obscurity is being in the dark. So again, we talked about those photographs, right? What became dark or what was dark can now become light. So that word image again, it represents the antecedent of the actual thing. Antecedent. Again, that's a, one of those words we use in, in English class. Um, a lot of my kids don't, have never heard of it, don't understand what that means. But that basically means, antecedent means it's taken the place of something else. So for instance, if I wrote a sentence that said, uh, Michael and his son are going to go play basketball. He is very good. Now, which he are we talking about? You don't know, right? And let's assume that Michael is a he, all right? Uh, and his son is a he, right? We're, we're looking at the pronoun he, and they are he's. Despite what everybody else may say, they are he's, okay? But we don't know which he we're talking about which means we need an antecedent, something to take, a, take place of that particular pronoun. So we could say instead, Michael and his father are going to, the, uh, going to the gym to play basketball. Michael is really good, okay? So the image represents the antecedent of the actual thing. God, 
I'm sorry, Jesus represents the antecedent of the actual thing, God. In Genesis, the Bible says that Adam was made in the image of God, and Jesus is the second Adam who reflects visibly the invisible God. So even though we can't see God, we have an antecedent there for us that we can see God. God is still invisible, but we have Jesus who we do see, who we do know. If we've asked him into our heart, we can use Jesus to get to God. And that's what the Bible plainly tells us. And let me look at one more thing, the word invisible. The invisible God can only be seen by the effects of his power, wisdom, and goodness, among other attributes. God didn't assume a visible form. However, Jesus represents God manifest in the flesh. Father, son, father, son. I don't see my father, but I have God. I, I, I don't see my father, I don't see God, but I see my, the son, the son who represents that. There may be somebody in here who's never seen their father. Or there may be someone in here whose father has left them. Or there may be someone whose father may have passed away, unfortunately. But we have a father who we can't see who's there for us. What do we do? How do we get access to that father? Through his son, Jesus. The scripture, John 1 one three through three basically sums up and says he was the image of the invisible God even before incarnation. So way back when before the world started, God knew that he would have a son that would represent who he is. So my overall message for my book basically says we should keep our eyes on the invisible God represented by his son so we can walk in the light and no longer remain in darkness. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, that's the way to get out of the darkness. That's the way to walk in the light. That's the way to get a father who you may not see, but who is still there for you. He's never left you, never forsakes you, even if you have never walked with him. Now, what makes a fiction story good? We're kind of transferring back to the book a little bit. In contemporary fiction, you need an emotional plot. You need relatable characters. There has to be struggles and conflicts. There has to be realistic dialogue. There needs to be a theme and a message. And it also needs to be entertaining. Now, I know sometimes that word entertainment is, a bad, entertainment is a bad word in church, right? We know that. We're not up here enter to entertain. However, there are points and places where we do need to entertain the people. Not during worship, not during praise, necessarily. Um, not, not necessarily even during the word. But we do know that all those things can still be entertaining to the people. In other words, that word entertain means to grasp hold, to catch attention. Um, my book, that's one of the things that, that I believe God spoke to me when I started writing it, is I want you to hook these kids, especially ones who don't like to read, who can't read. You need something to grasp them. And part of that could be entertainment. Now, let's just be honest. If, if we don't entertain our kids in, in church, they're gonna go find it somewhere else, right? So why not give them some? Right? And even if we do, they still gonna go find something somewhere else. But why not live them, give them some of this as well? and not just that only. So we need to have um, our kids to be entertained in a sense in a holy, in a holistic way as well. Um, so this is what makes good contemporary fiction. Uh, fiction. But I wanna look at that, that struggle um, conflicts part because if you don't have a conflict in the story, you really don't have a story. I call, I call that flatlining. In other words, your characters have to go up and down, have to have ups and downs in the story. If the character's just going straight, everything's good for the character, nothing bad happens to them, and then they die and go to heaven. Okay, we're happy for them, yay. But that was a boring story. <laughs> because there was just, it was flatline, or if everything is just horrible, going horribly for our characters, and they never get a victory, we feel bad for them, 
but it wasn't really a good story because our emotions weren't going up and down. If our emotions stay the same all the way through a book, before you even get there, you're gonna stop reading that book because it's boring, right? Um, so we need ups and downs. We need characters to struggle and be able to overcome some of those struggles and then have another struggle because that's real life. Anybody in here life just being perfect from day one? Anybody life being hell from day one? No, no, that's real life. So my three main characters, the first one, Jaron Foster. He has struggled with this boy named Diamond. He struggles with his poverty. And he has struggles with his father. Again, his father never wanted anything to do with him. Camry has struggles with relationships. Um, she's one who is never, she's in, you know, a sophomore or freshman in high school, never had a boyfriend all through. Her parents are like, no, you can't date, but, you know, right? I mean, that's, that's how I was, but didn't always work. Um, but she had never had a, a, a boyfriend, and then she gets to high school, and now she's discovering, and her best friend is, you know, one of them kind of girls, you know, one of them, y'all know what I'm talking about, one of them kind of girls, right? Um, so she's like, man, Cameron, you need to get, you need to get, you start going to somebody, talk to somebody. So she starts looking and she starts finding all these bad boys. Like she just finds herself attracted to these bad boys. Remember, her father's in prison and she has to have the wherewithal to say, you know what, I'm not dating anybody who is a bad boy because I know what that can turn out to be. I no longer have a father in my, well, my father in my life because he was a bad boy. And I also have a music video called um, Quench My Thirst that's based on Camry's life because she's thirsty. Y'all know what thirsty kid, kids are, thir thirsty girls. She's thirsting for this life to be like everybody else, but she knows better, right? And it, what's interesting is this, is this this music video, I've um, played it for my kids at school. Um, and the bottom line to this is, Camry says, you've been there for me all the time, talking about God. And I'm out here looking for these boys who ain't about nothing, right? And I played it to my class um, over the last couple of years, so they've seen the video. But then I have kids that I don't even know come up to me and be like, Hey, can you quench my thirst? I'm like, who, who are you? I don't know you. Um, but it, it lets me know that it's spreading. And hopefully that message is spreading as well, that you need to quench your thirst with God who says, come to me. Right? So she struggles with that, with relationships. She struggles with social justice. And, of course, she's struggling with her relationship with her father. And then Asen is struggling with bullying. He's a kid who, smart kid, you know, but he's longing so much for a relationship that he doesn't know how to approach that. And he bullies kids at school and nobody likes him and he struggled with finding friends and he's struggling with having a good, good connection with his father. So those are their struggles. And I, at this point, I want to um, play the book trailer. And with this book trailer, you're gonna listen to numerous scenes from each one of these characters. Um, can you all clue that, uh, clue, you got it? All right, I'm gonna move this, cause where is it? No, not that, no, no, not, not that. No, 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 not that one. I mean, we could play it and have a little dance party. Maybe later. Um, it should say book trailer. My Invisible Father book trailer. No, it's a, it's a YouTube. I sent it to the kid. It's a YouTube. Did he not put it on there? Where's Kit? There he is. 
So with this book trailer, again, it is different conversations that these characters are having with one another. Um, I'm going to plug my book, my audio book as well, because these scenes are basically from my audio book. And when um, it comes out, it's not out yet, but we, we're in the last stages. When it comes out, hopefully, um, for book, audio books are good. For people who, especially for people who struggle with reading, I try to get my kids who are struggling with reading to read audiobooks because you're still getting a story. You're still listening. And there are different skills that you get from stories, right? Um, everything from predicting, everything from um, uh, uh, analyzing. Um, so book, book, audiobooks are still good as well. I listen to a book, uh, audiobook every, um, almost every other day. Uh, and also read physical books as well. So those, those are both good things to do um, uh, if you're interested in them, all right? Kit, what are we, we are we gonna be cool? We cool? All right. Any questions about books and writing process? <laughs> we good? Oh, one question, Just share. No. No, no. One thing, there we go. If you want to do this, there may be times when you will need to run. Sometimes you run for your life. I knew about his reputation. What was your question? Time yeah, do you diamond was bright like, like me. Time that you write. But something else oh. about him intrigued me. Seeking him out may have been the worst decision of my life. You take no one for granted. I'm quite aware you've been wondering and inquiring about your father. Well, sweetie, the fact is he doesn't want to meet you. I twisted my face in disappointment and hurt, and I swallowed a lump of spit that rolled down my throat like a lubricated bowling ball. But my father doesn't want to meet me. He doesn't want me. What did I do for him not to want me? You have done absolutely nothing to make him be this way, son. He didn't want a child from the beginning. He wanted nothing to do with you even before you were born. They got in a car together and drove off while the lone cop strode towards me. My stomach was doing backflips. My forehead got hot. Moisture flooded my cheek. Fear gripped my entire body as the white police officer pointed his flashlight and his gun directly at my face. You are here because God saw fit that you should be here. So I am responsible for making sure you and your siblings are fulfilling all of what God wants for you. He did not give you life so you can be out there pushing drugs and frolicking with thugs. Nah, Mom. Don't come to me again with that God crap. Where is God when I need him? Where is God when you need him? I don't see God, just like I don't see my father. God is invisible to me. He ain't doing nothing for me. No, you are not going to talk crazy about God. You can be mad at me. You can be pissed at your father, but you better be grateful for what God has done for you. What, mom? What has he done for me? We live in this old house in this piss poor neighborhood. You work like a dog and we still ain't got nothing. What I got to be grateful for? I asked. Be thankful you have breath in your body and have air to breathe in. Which, by the way, you can't see either. I'm not going to pretend everything is roses, but I know everything ain't thorns either. Okay, Mr. Tough Guy. You have no clue what you're getting yourself into. There are usually only two places this will lead you, jail or the grave. The driver snatched my arm, and the dude in the passenger seat promptly presented a gun and pointed it directly at my dome. Don't say a word. Don't scream, don't make a sound. Try anything stupid, and you're inviting two bullets in your head before you can blink once. After a few more weeks of getting closer to Trey, I found out why he came to St. Louis in the first place, and I didn't like what I learned. So one day before going to lunch, I asked him about it. He didn't deny it. He started to explain himself, but I immediately told him we were no longer a couple. I ran away as he grabbed my arm and yelled my name. 
I broke loose from his grip and bolted into the girl's bathroom, closed the stall door and cried like a baby. But I wish we could do something about all this stuff happening in this city. All these carjackings, rolling gun battles, all these killings. Kids our age are murdered every week, some younger than us. If a white cop killed a reek, people would be marching in the streets, protesting, rioting, looting. That's what we do in the stupid city. Why are we not up in arms when some black person kills another black person? Why don't people get angry at that? Well, you do understand why people kill other white people too. It's not just about black on black crime. I don't need your statistics about white on white crime because that has nothing to do with me. White on white crime won't kill my little brother. White on white crime won't kill you, Jaren, or you, Prina. And white on white crime didn't kill Arik. So don't come to me talking about white folks kill white folks too. Jaren, I despise criminals. You know my daddy is locked up because he chose a life of crime over his family. I stay away from any and everything illegal. I ain't going out with no thug. You won't find the perfect person, Cam. You have to learn to forgive and move on. Ain't that what your God wants you to do? The newspaper had not announced the victim's name, and the story didn't reveal if the teen was okay or not. I gasped and experienced a racing heartbeat with mental torments shooting through my mind, wondering who the victim could have been. He helped me realize I had something to do, and I had to do it soon. And it involved a drug dealer, an armed robber, and a lousy father, all wrapped in one. Did you get statements? Dr. Hamilton asked Mr. Fogarty. This time, I interrupted. I lifted my head and said, sadly, no need for statements. I hit Joseph because he said something about my face. Dr. Hamilton's lips twitched. He blew out a long, exhausting breath. Then he picked up the phone. I guess we'll have to call your father. Day one of my suspension? A success! For seven hours, I ate and played Call of Duty Black Ops. I should get suspended more often. I didn't even take off my pajamas, didn't brush my teeth, didn't wash my face. Awesome! Then the home alarm system triggered. I nearly pooped my pants when the blaring sirens screamed. You moved from bad-mouthing and bullying people to punching kids in the face. If I were that kid's father, I'd tell him to hit you with a sucker punch the next time he sees you. You don't know me. Oh, so you like sitting by yourself? Yes, I mean, no. I mean, well, people just treat me like an outcast. You have no idea what that's like. Just as soon as those words escaped my mouth, I tried to suck them back in, but realized it too late. This is the second school I've been to this year. And in each one, I happen to be one of only a handful of black students. When I arrived here last week, nobody knew me. No one knew if I was mean or nice, and no one took the time to find out. No one told me that you were a jerk. I heard it as kids converse with one another. Not one student spoke directly to me. So you spend a lot of time with your father? Of course, my dad's like my best friend. Even though he encourages me to find other friends, he understands making friends is difficult for me, and he enjoys being my padre and my compadre. I wrestled with jealousy erupting in me. It was impossible to decipher what this argument was about, but this verbal fisticuff did not lack intensity. I stomped toward their bedroom, so I knocked with a fistful of fury. What do you want? My dad yelled as he yanked the door open. My heart jumped out of my chest and my eyes enlarged. My dad had never yelled at me like that before. He never cared enough. I don't understand why you guys have been arguing so much lately. Like, what's happening to you two? Are you getting a divorce or something? If you are, just do it already. I'm tired of all the fighting. And turned as I trudged back up the steps and to my room. I laid down, closed my eyes as tight as I could, and wished to God I could disappear because I was tired of my life.
you, you have to read it to really see what happened. Um, but that's just a taste of uh, uh, those three characters and the struggles that they're going through. You, I really didn't have any of their triumphs, but you would absolutely see those in the book as well. So, um, as you see, I like to use audio, visual, um, all different types of ways to reach the youth. As a teacher, I've learned that, they're, that kids learn in different ways, right? Some re learn using their hands, some with their ears, some with their eyes. And I found it, it is important to try to use different modes and ways to reach kids with the books even. So you will see, again, I have videos on my website uh, that kids, again, have been, you know, looking at um, with my social media, TikTok. I've, I'm still not there yet with TikTok. I've put down a few, few videos. And the videos I put so far are talking about other books that I love to read. It's just that I see that it's not just about me. It's, it's about being a reader. It's about being one who loves stories. But who doesn't love a good story? Ways that you can help, again, I said I was going to promote, um, ways you can help is to purchase books or get books and give them away. Um, you got nephews and nieces or neighbors who have teenagers. Uh, give them a book. If you know somebody who just doesn't like reading, tell them, challenge them. I read the first five chapters and see if you can put it down, right? Check out books from the library. Even if you don't buy them, I'm, I'm okay with that because I'm a librarian. I love to see books leave the libraries. Check them out. Tell others about the book. Contact schools and churches. Let them know. So they can contact me. Um, get on my mailing list. Go to my social media. We have books downstairs, and there's a poster there that has my uh, social media and my website. You can um, click the code, the QR code, and you can get to my website. Get on my mailing list. You'll find out uh, the things that I'm doing on a monthly basis. I write a, a, a newsletter. I'm sorry. A, um, yeah, I, I do write a newsletter once a month, uh, which usually just talks about what's coming up next. And then I also write a blog once a month as well, which is about a two or three minute read. Um, but you'll be able to get firsthand on when the audio book comes out and when the sequel is coming out. The sequel, by the way, is called My Invisible Name. Um, so it's going to focus on a lot about being the name, how, how important a name is, how important your name is. You have one of the characters who ends up in, in, in the juvenile facility, and he's no longer a name. He's a number in the system, and how, how horrible that is and what we can do about that. Um, read the book, review it, rate it. That's one of the best things we could do is after you read it, give me a real true-to-life rating um, on Amazon or Goodreads, if you know what that is. Um, those things are important. And, and speaking of review, I do have a couple of reviews that I have seen on these parts. Um, before I do that, Sister Sharon, question was, um, when do I write? What are the time periods that I write? And um, as a teacher, it's literally impossible for me to write from September to May. So I use June, July, and part of August to do most of my writing. I find myself writing a lot at 10 o'clock at night, especially with the librarian job. I'll come home from there at 8.15, uh, 8.30, and then I'll write for about a couple of hours. I haven't started yet because I've been preparing for this for the last two weeks since we've been out of school. But that's when I write, do most of my writing is during the summer. And um, I'm going to start getting into a habit of um, writing a little bit in the morning and a little bit in the afternoon as well. Um, here are a couple of book reviews that I've seen. Well, this one is actually a book review from someone from St. Louis who I do not know it is. So yeah, I didn't pay her. She just, she, she read the book and she wrote it, all right? I have no idea who this person is. But she says the story was fast paced and got to the point. It kept my attention so much that I couldn't put it down. There was a surprise towards the end that ties the characters together. I can't wait to read more books by Jer. And by the way, my um, pen name, the name that I use to write is Jer Armstead Jones. 
And I did that because I wanted to have a different name than just my teacher name, my real name. And, you know, um, but one thing that really, reason that I decided to have a pen name is because I wanted my biological father's name to kind of be in there. Uh, all of you, not all of you, but a lot of you know my stepfather, Melvin Jones, and I took on his name. And, you know, I can't be more thankful for what he has done for me since I've known him at four years old to, oh my gosh, 50 years. It's been 50 years. Uh, he, he came into my life, he came into our life 50 years ago when I was four years old. And so I, you know, I wanted both of my father's names basically to be in my, in, in my, um, my pen name. Um, my biological father passed away in 2018, um, but, and I did not meet him, well, I guess I met him when I was a baby, but didn't get reintroduced to him again until I was my early teenage years, 14, 15, somewhere around in there. And um, it took a while for us to grow, but we grew together and uh, had a great relationship, especially towards the end when he got sick. Um, where we, you know, I had to spend a lot more time with him. Um, but he doesn't have, he didn't have another son. He had two daughters. So his last name was going to stop with him. And I felt like one way to keep his name going, you know, if I write one book, this book is going to go on forever, which means his last name will go on forever as well. So that's why I decided to change my pen name to Jer. Armstead Jones. And his review, this review is from a, I got into a contest um, from a, a group called the Writer's Digest. Um, and this was one of the judge's words, and this is part of it, I didn't write everything, but this is part of the words that he wrote, it or she, I don't know if it was he or she. Uh, it's a striking story with the potential to inspire both young adult readers and a general audience. And then he goes in to talk about how gritty the characters are and how real they are as well. Um, but I thought this was really, again, this is, I knew being in this place today, we'd have a lot of people who are not teenagers and young adults. So I wanted to let you know that it's not me just saying that anyone would enjoy and get something from this book. And then finally, again, um, I do have an audio book coming out soon. Um, so again, if you get on my mailing list, uh, you'll have uh, the opportunity to, to get emails when that actually does come out. That's all I have, but I do want to emphasize that I'm up here because of what God has done in my life so much um, that I am thankful for. I've been in some rough places in my life, and without, you know, Pastor says, I've, I've been here, I've been here since 91. Um, after my divorce, I did leave for a couple of years and just went to a couple other different churches for a couple of years and finally settled on one. But I, I don't know what happened that we decided to come back. Like, nothing bad happened. The pastor there wasn't some creep or whatever. It was just something that drew us back. And uh, that probably was about 10 years ago, maybe. And my wife, um, she is... She's like, she does almost everything. She's done a little bit of everything in this church. Um, she loves everyone here. She loves the, the, the pastors. Our pastor, uh, I'm getting choked up. You know, it's weird because when I first met her, I said, you know, um, you know, I go to church. And she didn't really grow up going to church. And I didn't really either until I turned like 13. She did go to, was it Lutheran or Lutheran church at, at, um, when she was younger, but she didn't really grow in church. So when we first met, I was trying to get her to go to church with me. She was like, eh, okay, not really very enthused about it. Um, and I, I was like, God, this, this ain't going to work, you know. You know she's just, but God just said, just be patient. Just be patient. She knew, he knew her better than I did, obviously. And he knew that she, he would take her into places she'd never been and experience things she's never experienced. And she, there came to a point where she was just on fire. And she's been a servant to so many here in this church. And again, she loves Bishop. She loves Pastor Brenda. Uh, we do. We both do, obviously. And uh, 
So I, I thank them for this opportunity. Like, this, this is not something I asked for. He, he asked for me to do it, and I don't do everything he asked me to do. <laughs> um, I'm working on it. Uh, but I, I know he knows my heart. I know he knows my heart. He knows our heart. So um, I'm going to leave you with, with this. You do not have an invisible father that cannot be seen. So please look upon him each and every day. Amen. Thank you. All right. Good night. This is us. remain standing. Uh, Jared is a, is a treasure here, and we thank you for coming to just be yourself. Yeah. I can't tell you how powerful that is and how, how important it is uh, today. We're thrilled that we're able to see one another and to see Melvin and Rhonda again, and they uh, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. And for, a while, for a while, Rhonda, his mom, was our administrative assistant, and God moved them on to, to other places. We love you. Melvin used to bring folk here every week, and he loved Metro. It just poured into our lives. We thank you guys so much for all that you've done. Um, I just want to say real quickly about Jared, that Jared loves God, for real. I mean, this is not, it's not an act, and we ask you to share like this because this is really kind of where God really wants us to be just people that love him and through our our walk in Christ you can see you can really see that God really has certain things in store for you Shiloh uh, we went to visit her after her father passed I think it was and went to her home with her mom and sisters and brothers and we were talking a little bit and, and uh, I forget how we got on the topic of people leaving and uh, she she said uh, it wasn't even just leaving Metro, it was just walking away from the things of God and that kind of thing. And she said, after what God's done for me, she looked at me and she said, Pastor Ray, Pastor Brenda, I love you guys. But even if you mess up, I'm never leaving God. <laughs> me and Pastor Brenda slapped five and said, this child saved for real. <laughs> she walking with God. We know there's more for your lives and what God wants to do with you. And, uh, we've been talking the last six months or so here at Metro, almost a year, about new wine, new wine skin. You kind of smelling it? The wine is the content. There's always certain things that are the same with wine, no matter what. But then there are certain uniquenesses to the flavors. New wine. Wine skin is the container and speaks of the different methods that God will use. When Jesus came, the methods that he used irritated the establishment. They saw no value in him. They called him a bastard. They said he was illegitimate. His style was nothing like the rabbi nothing like him. Even when he came to his own hometown and he was sitting, they asked him to speak. They didn't regard him as some voice that was significant. He was a brother sitting there and they allowed for that in the synagogue services. And he stood up and opened up the, the text to Isaiah. We're on to something fresh and new and uh, you guys are part of that. Amen. And we're glad to support you. We're glad we're here get the book all right let's move forward what God's really trying to use us to do always learn especially when things are sent to you in a way that's not conventional even when there were ways even when those conventional ways were used of God in the past when God changes it up he's trying to help us to get ready to meet and minister to other people in a way that they need access to the glory. 
That's what you did for us today. Thank you. Let's give them this blessing. Amen. I know you're full, and I'm going to wait. But I'm going to let you know we want to hear from you. Okay. Tracy just got back from Zambia. And, uh, we'll see. God did some powerful things. Love the videos and the pictures. What the Lord did there. Thank you for your obedience to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that we've heard today as this young man has walked through and shared with us characters and stories that represent so many of us or people that we know. We thank you for the wisdom that you put in his heart and put in his wife's heart on how to reach the present generation. We pray that you would cause this book and many others that you give him to write to be breathed upon by your spirit yes. and that these words will find their way into the lives and the hearts of people who are not in this building. Yes. They're not in any building. They have no interest in being. We thank you for raising up this couple to reach them, to minister to them, and we pray that you would help us to be a support to them, not only in purchasing the material, but more importantly, in utilizing what we learn in those pages. Thank you. Thank you for helping them. We ask your blessing and your peace upon their lives. We confirm the word of the living God to them. And all that they've had to walk through have chosen to walk through. We surrender them to you. Thank you for the open doors. Thank you for the ministry of Jesus. And thank you that we're able to behold you, Father, through the life of a man and a woman who's been and being healed. Thank you for the wisdom that's there to minister to a generation that is long, long, long needed what you've brought through them we bless them now and we thank you for what you're doing and we say yes to your will in all things if you've never responded to this Jesus you need to I know you've heard that before you do, you need to he really is the answer there is no one else don't be fooled any longer into believing that somehow you'll find it on your own Here's how the Bible puts it. On the day you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. You've heard his voice today. Don't push it aside any longer. This is what your heart is longing for. It's a relationship with Jesus. That's why he came. It was for you. God helped to heal my self-esteem problem when he said this to me. You were worth the cross to me. You were worth it. You were worth the cross. And if you did not grow up with the benefit of family, told you your worth and affirmed it. Every time you see the cross, remember it. You were worth that for Jesus, to Jesus. He loves you. And the best that could ever be in your life will come as you say yes to him. Father, we thank you and we say yes to you. Maybe this is the first time for some of you ever to say yes, but do it now. If it seems like this isn't formal enough, this is the real deal. He wants you to believe him. Forget all the other formality. Believe him. Trust him. Give him your heart. He says it like this. If you will receive him, believe and receive him, he will change you. He'll make you into the person 
that you really do need to be and that you long to be. Is there anyone here that needs to do that? Is anybody watching? Do it now. Come on. Out of your heart, say it. Lord God, I've heard your word through that man, and I believe it. You love me. You sent your son. He died for me. He gave his life for me. I didn't know it. But you see me as worth the price of the cross. I didn't know I was that valuable to you. Now I see it. So I surrender to you. I need you. Come live in me. Take over my life. Thank you, Lord. I say yes, and I take you in. Jesus, be glorified in my life. You get the credit for everything I am and everything I do. Amen. Amen. If you've said yes to Christ today, you see the sign. Let us know. If you're here today, you have a minute, come here and uh, we'd love to talk with you. At least they will. And talk with you a little bit more about that. Have a great week. Look forward to it this, this, this Wednesday. And then we'll see you again next Sunday. God bless you. The Lord bless you. Keep you.